Good evening, everyone. Glad that you were all able to make it out. I know I had a little bit of difficulty getting here. I took one road and it was closed, and then I took a different road and there was an accident there. And so it's like, man, I wonder if I'm ever going to get there. But I'm glad to be here. And uh, I'd invite you to go ahead and open up your Bibles to Job chapter 19. We left off last week in Job chapter 19, and we were about halfway through the chapter, I would say, maybe a little bit more than that. We left off at verse 23, so Job chapter 19, verse 23. And we had been reading about Job's response once again, to one of his friends, they've been having this back and forth conversation where Job's friends uh, challenge him, uh, basically using their understanding and their wisdom of the way that the world works. And from their point of view, Job must have done something wicked to earn all of these consequences that are falling on him. And so they've been trying to Convince him that he needs to repent, while Job continues to proclaim his innocence to them. And so, at the start of Job chapter 19, Job had been speaking once again, and he had had the, this, um, this despairing, hopeless attitude. He was expressing how he felt helpless, how he felt besieged all around him, uh, how he felt like he had no friends, uh, his relatives were against him. He was explaining what a sorry state he was in. And we left off at verse 23. And this is where Job actually turns for a moment uh, the tone of his speech. And we have this, this confident ray of hope in the midst of this hopelessness. So let's go ahead and read from Job chapter, tw or Job chapter 19, verse 23, down to the end of the chapter, and then we'll discuss it. It says, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were recorded in a book. That's ironic, right? We know they are. That with an iron stylus and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. Yet as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh, I will see God, whom I, on my part, shall behold for myself, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. My heart faints within me. If you say, how shall we persecute him? And what pretext for a case can we find against him? Then be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, so that you may know there is judgment. So this is markedly different than how Job was talking uh, in the first half of the chapter. You know, before he was saying, I, I feel hopeless, I feel lost, I feel like I have no one on my side. And he all of a sudden turns it around. He starts out confidently and says that he wishes that his words were recorded in a book. Well, Job got his wish there. They're recorded in a book for us, right? Or that they were engraved in stone. And then notice here in verse 25, he says, Yet as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. So, who is Job talking about? Who is this hopeful Redeemer that Job places everything on? Who is he hoping on? The Messiah. The Messiah, okay. Other thoughts? Matt? Maybe from his perspective, more simplistically, just God himself. I mean, God? I think we, could, we can easily see this fulfilled in Christ. But, sure. But maybe from his perspective, just like, I, even though I think God is, you would be wrong here, he's still God, and I love him, and he's going to do the best yeah. for me. Yeah. yeah. Cookie, did you have your hand up? No. Okay. Yeah, so I think I, think I would agree. Um, certainly when we look back on this, when we see the word Redeemer, right, who do we think of? We have this song, right? I, I think it might even be based on this verse here. I know that my Redeemer lives, right? Never 
Jesus. Yeah, and ever prays for me. So we know who our Redeemer is, right? That's who my mind automatically goes to Jesus when I read that. And certainly, whether Job understood that he was prophesying it or not, he's referring to Jesus, right? His words are fulfilled in Jesus. But to Matt's point, he might have had a little bit more of a vague idea of who he was referring to. He certainly knows that there is this heavenly advocate for him, okay? Now, he might be thinking of the Messiah, like Pat said, or just more generally in God. We know that Job feels conflicted. He feels like God's turned against him, but he's said before that he still hopes and prays for God. You know, he, he has his hope in God, even though God seems to be against him for some reason. Because who else should he turn to? He should turn to God, right? So this is part of the big conflict for Job is that he's a very righteous and godly man and places his faith in God, but he's confused because God seems to have pulled away from him and he doesn't understand why. So this is what's driving a lot of conflict in Job. Rick? Yeah, and you'll see in the, the next couple of verses after that, I mean, he is definitely still has his faith yeah. on God. How my heart yearns within me, you know, to see God for that to happen because he knows that he will vindicate him and redeem him. Yeah. So even though he, he goes back and forth, he says that I'm utterly destroyed, right? A couple more days and I'm not going to last. But then he says, but I'm, hope, I'm placing my hope in God and he, I know he's going to come through for me. So again, we know that from the suffering that Job is going through, he's on a, a little bit of a roller coaster, right? He has these highs and he, these lows because, you know, how would you feel if, if God was fully against you? You know, well, I'm, I'm destroyed. I'm ruined. I can't be helped, you know? But then God is also his, his rock, his faith, you know? So he places his faith in God. And so he just kind of yo-yos back and forth between the two. Kim? We see here that uh, Job's faith just shines through. He has this confident mm -hmm. declaration in verse 25 and on beyond 25. Yeah. About what he knows and he believes with all that he is. Yeah. He dies, he dies, he's suffering, so he's like, well, regardless of all that, yeah. and you guys are picking at me, I know that my Redeemer yeah. is eternal, and he lives. Yeah. Now, at the very end, he, he sort of, after making this <laughs> declaration of who he's placing his trust in, he, he's uh, actually before we before we move on to the end of the chapter, I did want to point something out. So, if you look at the word... Uh, for Redeemer, it's actually Goel, or Goal, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. But that word is also used in another part of the Bible. It's used in Numbers chapter 35, okay? And if you want to just briefly turn over there with me to Numbers chapter 35, I know that you'll recognize this once we're there. Numbers chapter 35 if you read down from verse 12 to verse 28, you see this, this whole section about avengers, right? If someone is wronged, they get this avenger, and there are these cities of refuge that they can flee to. We, we've studied this in the past. And so I'll just read a snippet of this. Numbers chapter 35, verse 12 says, The cities shall serve you as a refuge, from the avenger. That's the word goel or redeemer. So that the one who commits manslaughter does not die until he stands before the congregation for trial. And you can go on to read some of the other responsibilities of this goel, of the avenger, of the redeemer. And so this avenger or redeemer was one who sought justice. They were a vindicator. They were an advocate of one who was unjustly accused. And so we can certainly see how that applies, as we've mentioned before, to Jesus in our case, right? As we look back on this passage with Jesus in mind, as the fulfillment of it, we can see how he is justice for us, how he is an advocate on our behalf, how he vindicates us, right? So I just like the way that that language is used between the New Testament and the Old Testament. It's always nice to see how they're connected 
you know, sometimes we can think of the Old Testament as just being some dusty history and we focus all of our attention and our efforts on the New Testament because that's where the gospel is. But really, they're tied together, right? We, we need both of them because they tell the whole story of Jesus, right? Any thoughts or comments on that before we move to the end of the chapter? Matt? Another one that comes to mind with that Hebrew word, goeo, or however we want to say that. Yeah. Uh, the Redeemer is in, in Ruth. You know, the whole yes. situation where those women are lost without, you know, their husbands have all died, and yep. Boaz becomes the redeemer because he's able to then marry in and have children. And, you know, yeah, exactly. Christ comes through, through <laughs> him, right? He does, yeah. It's neat to see those connections that are made over and over again as you go throughout. But now, after making this confident statement in his redeemer, notice verse 28. Job now directs his attention perhaps more fully on his friends, and he has a message for them, right? In verse 28 of Job 19, he says, If you say, talking to his friends, he says, If you say, how shall we persecute him? And for what pretext for a case against him can we find? Then be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, so you may know that there is judgment. So, phrase that in modern language for me. What is Job saying? What is his message to his friends? What is he saying? Rick? Basically, that if they persecute him, they're going to face judgment from God. Right? That's the basic idea. Yeah. Yeah. He's, you know, look at just the, the latter half of verse 28, where it says, and what pretext for a case can we find against him, Right. That's what someone says when they're trying to find someone guilty and they don't know for a fact that they're guilty, right? What case can I make up against them? What can I find wrong against them? You know, that's, that's what Job is warning them about. You know, if you guys are groping for a reason that I'm in the wrong and you're trying to find reasons that I might be in the wrong, you're going to bring judgment down on yourselves, right? This is his warning is you need to be careful that you're not falsely accusing me because you're going to get judgment brought on you for that, right? Thoughts or comments there? Rick? Just one interesting thing here that the New International Version says, uh, if you say how we will hound him, since he's the problem, basically, yeah. since he's the root of the trouble, how will we hound him? That's, that's pretty telling of what yeah. he's talking about. And it kind of reveals the attitude that Job has, right? Again, this is, this is a righteous man. He's suffering a lot of hardships, doesn't know why, but he's basically saying that, you know, my friends, they're hounding me, right? You're persecuting me. You're trying to find a reason to say that I'm in the wrong. Now, all they have so far is what Job is suffering, but they don't have a cause. So far, they've just been saying, well, you know, Wicked men get punished, and it looks like you're being punished. So I think you must be evil, right? You must be wicked, right? That's kind of their logic. They don't really have grounds to accuse him. This is an assumption that they're making, All right? Now let's go ahead and flip over to chapter 20. Job chapter 20. So after making these statements... Another one of Job's friends chimes up again, and this time it's Zophar. <clears throat> and Zophar the Nemeathite uh, responded, Therefore my disquieting thoughts make me respond, even because of my inward agitation. So Zophar is saying, you, you know, Job, your speech bothered me. It's, it's disquieting to me. It's, you know, it, it's causing me agitation. And and I, I get this mental impression that Zophar is, you know, he's just like disappointed in Job. You know, like you're, the things you're saying are bothering me, Job. You're, you know, you're all out of whack, you know, trying to sound like this wise, sagely man is kind of the result or the uh, impression that I get from these words. He goes on, he says, I listened to the reprimand, which insults me. And the spirit of my understanding makes me answer. So, you know, Job, I listen to you get mad at me, and it's insulting, quite frankly. And 
My understanding, the spirit of my understanding, my common sense makes me answer. I have to respond to you. And so now notice what Zophar falls back on here in verse four. He says, do you know this from ancient times, from the establishment of mankind on earth, that the rejoicing of the wicked is short and the joy of the godless momentary? What did Zophar just fall back on? That's the old proverbial wisdom that we've been talking about. The so old proverbial they wisdom. That, right? Yeah. They keep bringing up the same thing. The wisdom of the ancients, the wisdom of the ancient world, the proverbs, the, you know, this knowledge of mankind from ancient days, ancient times. They keep going back to the same thing over and over again, which Job has repeatedly tried to tell them doesn't apply to him in this situation. He's aware of that knowledge. He's told them that. I understand the same knowledge that you do, but what you're not seeming to get is that it is not applicable to me in this case, right? And that's what they're failing to get. And we can kind of see here that Zophar is just falling right back on it. He's not listening to his friend. And he says that this rejoicing of the wicked is temporary, okay? seeming to imply that, you know, whatever rejoicing or happiness Job had was a temporary thing. And now Job is now suffering because of his apparent wickedness, right? He says in verse 6, Though his arrogance reaches the heavens and his head touches the clouds, he perishes forever like his refuse. Those who have seen him will say, where is he? He flies away like a dream, and they cannot find him. Like a vision of the night, he is chased away. The eye which saw him sees him no longer, and his place no longer beholds him. His sons favor the poor, and his hands give back his wealth. His bones are full of his youthful strength, but it lies down with him in the dust. Though evil tastes sweet in his mouth, and he hides it under his tongue, though he desires it, it will not let him go, but he holds it in his mouth. Yet his food in his stomach is changed to the venom of cobras within him. So we'll, we'll stop there halfway through this, this speech. Now, Zophar is, uh, once again, he, he's waxing a little bit poetic here. He's using a lot of dense Hebrew poetry to make his point right, where he'll kind of reinstate the same idea over and over, but with with uh, different words each time to kind of drive home the point of what he's making. So this repetition of ideas is a way to drive home emphasis of what he's trying to say, right? And what is Zophar trying to say here? In all of these different verses, these different lines here, what, what is it that he's trying to say when he makes these statements you know, though evil tastes sweet in his mouth and he hides it under his tongue, what what are some of these things that he's getting at here? What's this idea that he's going after? Rick? He's, he's still saying that uh, basically that Job is paying for a sin, basically. That he's, he's enjoyed some sin and now he must pay the price. That's, that's yeah. how I look at it. Yeah, I think, I think if you follow Zophar's narrative here, he starts out kind of saying, you know, the wicked can enjoy victories, but they're very short-lived and they're temporary, right? And then he starts to describe with these poetic words the ways in which evil starts to turn on the wicked, right? It tastes sweet in their mouth, but then it sours in their stomach, right? So the things that they reap, you know, the things they sow, they're starting to reap. And it's turning against them. And he keeps going and he starts to describe how it goes from a brief temporary victory to things souring on them to their ultimate demise. Right? So before we keep going into that, any thoughts or comments on, on these verses? Okay, let's, let's continue here. So he says, he swallows riches, but will vomit them up. God will expel them from his belly. He sucks the poison of cobras. The viper's tongue kills him. 
He does not look at the streams, the rivers flowing with honey and curds. He returns the product of his labor and cannot swallow it. As to the riches of his trading, he cannot even enjoy them. For he has oppressed and neglected the poor. He has seized a house which he has not built. Because he knew no quiet within him, he does not retain anything he desires. Nothing remains for him to devour. Therefore, his prosperity does not endure. Now, remember at the beginning, in Job chapter 1 and 2, we, we learned that Job was quite a prosperous man, right? And so Zophar seems to be viewing this as, well, Job was a prosperous man and he lost all of that wealth, right? Job is in a sorry, sad state in Zophar's eyes right now. He's, he's poor, he's, he's, he's dirty, he's, he's sick. And so in Zophar's eyes, as he's describing it, this is Job reaping what he's sown. You know, this is, this is how things turn on the wicked, and this is what they look like. And that's what you look like, Job. You look like a wicked man who's now receiving his due, right? And so this is what he's basing his argument on. And, he, and he's trying to, by stating these things to Job, again, try and wake Job up, so to speak. You know, this is what happens to wicked people, Job. Now look in the mirror. Do you see the similarity? You know, so this is how Zophar is trying to make Job understand that you're wicked, right? Even though we know that's false. So he continues <clears throat> and he says, In the fullness of his excess, he will be cramped. The hand of everyone who suffers will come against him. When he fills his belly, God will send his fierce anger on him and it will rain on him while he is eating. He may flee from the iron weapon, but the bronze bow will pierce him. It is drawn and comes out his back, even the flashing point from his gallbladder. Terrors come upon him. Now notice verse 24 and 25. Zophar says that the wicked are going to be pierced by this bronze bow, right? Do you think that he might be using Job's previous words against him? Do you remember over in, uh, let's see, what verse was it? Job chapter 6 and verse 4. Let's flip back there for just a minute. Job chapter 6 verse 4 was way early on when Job was talking about how he felt attacked by God. And look at what Job said back in chapter 6 verse 4. He says, for the arrows of the Almighty are in me. My spirit drinks their poison. The terrors of God lined up against me. And so Zophar, quite cleverly, is using Job's own lament against him. He's saying, Job, you're saying how you feel like God's arrows are within you? Well, that's what happens to the wicked, right? This is what he's trying to stress home. So we can see how the arguments that the friends are making, they're, they're trying their best to make Job realize that his state is the same as a wicked man who's being punished, right? And so therefore, you must be guilty of something, right? Rick? Yeah, you'll notice in verse 20, I mean, this, this goes along with what you're saying. Uh, this translation says, because his appetite is never satisfied, and he's talking about someone who's living a sinful life, yep. right? Yep. He cannot escape with his treasure, and he's basically saying, you know, God has taken your treasure because you were living a sinful life. So, And sin does do that to us. It destroys us over time if we, you know, live in that uh, perpetually. Yeah, exactly. And it's... You know, it's it's really faulty logic, right? I mean, I can certainly understand where Zophar is coming from. You know, that would be like saying every every car that I've seen has four wheels, okay? Now, I saw something on the road that has four wheels, and it must be a car then because cars have four wheels. And you could say, no, that's a tractor, and I can say, no. It's got four wheels. It must be a car. Every car I've seen has four wheels, right? It's a logical fallacy, right? And that is what his friends are doing 
And, and Job obviously knows that he is not in the wrong here, and he's really trying to break through to his friends, but it seems as though every time that Job tries to make this plea to them for them to listen to him, they think he's being arrogant and stubborn, and it almost makes them dig their heels in further. Look at Job chapter 2. Go back to Job chapter 2 very briefly. Job chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. Notice what this says. In Job chapter 2, 11 to 13, it says, Now when Job's three friends heard all about his adversity that had come upon him, they came, each one from his own place, Eliphaz the Tenemite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Naamathite, and they made an appointment together to come and notice what it says to sympathize with him and to comfort him, right? And then it goes on to say how they sat with him for a week. They came to sympathize and to comfort him. Now, does that sound like what they're doing now? They've certainly changed their tune. They've gone from, we came to sympathize and comfort our friend who was suffering, and they've now switched to berating our friend to try and get him to repent of wickedness. They're calling him this stubborn, arrogant, wicked man, right? And it's because they came thinking that, you know, their, their friend had fallen by the wayside and they needed to comfort, sympathize, and then convince him to change his ways so that he could be back on the right path with God, right? But when Job started to protest his innocence, instead of listening to their friend, they took that as arrogance. Well, you just don't want to hear our advice, Joe. Therefore, you're arrogant and stupid, you know, and, and you're deserving what you get because you must be wicked if you're not listening to righteous advice. So they've really changed their tune since the beginning of our study. Thoughts on that? Do you agree, disagree? Matt? Maybe they thought he knew he did wrong and they're going there to hear him yeah. But then, wait a minute. He said, yeah. Maybe didn't meet their expectations. Yeah. Rick? Even if they came in total sincerity just to sympathize and, and to try to help him out and maybe give him that advice, you know how it is. Things, when things turn into sort of an argument or become a little argumentative and people get upset, <laughs> and because uh, who was it here in this chapter 20? So far. So far, it's like insulted. Yeah, and he's saying I'm insulted. You've insulted yeah. me. I'm mad. You know. So. Well, and and think about that. How reasonable are you when you feel insulted? Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> it's it's very human nature to get defensive when when someone says something that kind of pricks your pride or whatever. You know, and and some of the things that Job has said. You know, animals could tell me this advice. You know, and. And Bildad speaks up, are you calling me an animal? What? You know, and so we're starting to see a little bit of those hurt feelings on both sides, right? They've, they've said some pretty harsh things to Job, who has in turn said some very sarcastic and harsh things to them. And so now everyone's really just kind of entrenching themselves in their argument, right? So we can see how a lack of gentleness, a lack of compassion when dealing with one another can really break down communications and it can really cause some distress that maybe doesn't need to be there. So that's that's a little bit of a lesson for us. We're just a few verses away from the end, so let's go ahead and finish this one out. Chapter, uh, chapter 20, verse 26 says, Complete darkness is held in reserve for his treasures. The unfanned fire will devour him. It will consume the survivor in his tent. The heavens will reveal his guilt, and the earth will rise up against him. The increase of his house will disappear. His possessions will flow away on the day of his anger, his anger being God's anger. This is a wicked person's portion from God, the inheritance decreed to him by God. And so really, verse 29 is just so far summarizing his whole argument. Everything that I've said, Job, in this last chapter, in this, in my speech, everything here is the inheritance of the wicked 
from God. That is what he's been trying to get across to Job, is that these types of sufferings come upon the wicked from God, and these are the same kinds of suffering that you're enduring. And so that's really what Job or what Zophar is trying to convey to Job. Any other thoughts or questions before we wrap up tonight? Next week, we're going to go back to Job again and hear Job's response to Zophar here in chapter 21. All right. Thank you, everyone. For an invitation, I wanted to think a little bit about a verse in Galatians. Galatians chapter 2. Verses, uh, verse 20, and then also think about the song we sang before our class began, Into Our Hands. That's number 616. But if we look there in Galatians, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. This is Paul talking, right? But we can say that too. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ, who lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So there's a lot, a lot packed in there. Think about um, this idea that we understand Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and he rose from the dead. But Paul's saying, I have been crucified with Christ. And by extension, we each have been crucified with with Christ. We put the old man of sin to death, and we've risen to walk in newness of life. And so if we're truly living a life like that, it is no longer I who live. I'm not living for what all the things I want to do and all my favorite things. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So our lives should be directed by Christ's will. And the life I now live in the flesh, you know, we still, even though we look for future glory, we're still here in our fleshly bodies, right? But this life we live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God. And we walk by faith. And, and what did he do? He loved me. And how much? And he gave himself for me back on the cross again, right? He gave himself for me. We, he thinks about that here in an individual way, but also collectively as a church. But each of us individually can recognize that blessing of what Jesus did for us and how we ought to live. And thinking about that hymn we sang, 616, Into Our Hands. Into Our Hands is given this, this uh, stewardship of the gospel, right? And the, the way the verse goes, swiftly we're turning life's daily pages. Swiftly the hours are changing to years. You know, life just flying by, especially as we get older and we look back and what? Where'd all that time go? It's just going. Time marches on. But how are we using God's golden moments? Shall we reap glory? Shall we reap tears? And then there's that idea. Into our hands the gospel is given. Into our hands is given the light. Haste or hurry up. Let's carry God's precious message to all those who are in error and get them to come back to the right. And so how are we doing on that? I think I tend to get busy with my things I'm interested in, uh, but we ought to be interested in primarily Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And are we sharing that, that good message? Are there, and maybe there are some who need to respond to the gospel themselves tonight, but at least let's think about that idea that we need to be sharing the gospel with others. And in our imitation song, we're going to sing 457, The Last Mile of the Way. Kind of thinking about Job then. You know, he's, he's struggling and uh, trying to get to that last mile. And maybe we're struggling in different aspects of our life. Are we, are we uh, hanging in there? So I want to encourage you to hang in there. Share the gospel. To stay faithful and to obey the Lord. If there's any way we can help you with any of that tonight, we want to encourage you to come and as we stand and sing the song together.